Dr. Bostos. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's It's been a while, I guess, since I, I was here with you, at least on this side of, of the of the of the screen. And I actually, so last, last lecture, we said that we were gonna do the variable rate, but actually when I went back to what we had done and where we stopped last time, I don't think we we're quite ready for that. So that's probably gonna be something we do next Monday. And the reason is because we haven't uh, finished going through the validation of the zones. So last thing that we did in class was just to create the zones. And so today I want to do the validation of the zones. And also there's going to be a little bit of a difference in the script, the partial script that you have and what I'm going to do today, mostly because after um, going, going through the exercise that Dr. Uh, Virk uh, had, had you guys go through, and he was talking about, um, you know, working those, well, maybe, maybe I'm just going to get started and then, and then we can talk about what we're going to do differently when we see it. That's going to be easier. So I'm just going to, you know, as always, I'm just going to come here to my to my class folder. Uh, the one that has that is my project, right? So it has my initials. I'm going to double click on that um, project icon to launch it. And so you should be seeing now your your project. So if you can do that as well, please go ahead and do it if you haven't. And at that point, you will see and make sure that it is your project that you're that you that you're seeing by checking the name uh, on the top right. So it, if it is the right one, what we're going to do next, just uh, resize this so it can see better. We're going to come here on the files tab. If you are um, I mean, regardless where you are in the project, just make sure to click that blue art button there to take you to the home directory of this project. And then we're gonna go in code and we're gonna come here on zone partial. That's what you would have. Oh, you know what I actually, didn't pull up my cheat sheet. So let me do that. Just give me a second here. So I make sure that we're on the right track. Sorry, I was, was too, too excited chatting and forgot to set everything up. So while Dr. Bosworth is getting all his things ready there, um, Sarah sent me an email yesterday or the day before asking um, what the plans are for the final exam in this course. So um, when Dr. Bosworth finishes uh, instructing you on, on our, um, you know, get, get all the way through this field, then um, we're going to assign you a project um, that will ask you to replicate most of these steps that you've gone through here in R. Um, you have the code, so it should be fairly simple for you, but it'll be a different data set, a different field uh, to try and you know, go through all the steps of creating uh, management zones with the data that are available. And so uh, we anticipate Dr. Bosses will finish up on Wednesday next week. And so th that'll be the last official class period. So we'll allow you the, the final week of classes and up until the day of the final exam to complete that project. And that'll be your final exam. And uh, what is expected of the graduate students will be slightly more complicated than what we expect of the three undergraduates that are part of the course. Um, so uh, you should have, you know, plenty of time to do that. Um, and anyways, we will be, he will be available. I can't help you much with our studio. <laughs> Dr. Boss will be available to help you if you get hung up on, on something with the code or whatever you're doing. Yes, absolutely. What is the day of the final? So Sarah was asking, what's the date of final was supposed to be? The date, of course, I just looked up the schedule. The date is May 11th is when our class final is scheduled. So normally it would be from, um, let's see, Monday, 
it would be the exam would normally be scheduled from May to 11 on May 11th. But you would just turn your project in by the end of the day on May 11th. All right, so I think I was I, I was able to pull up everything I need here for us to, to go through. So I uh, just wanna show you here, let me open my completed so you can so I can just show you without having to rerun everything quite yet. But the point that we stopped was right here. So this is or approximately this. I, I made some small changes, but this is what at least like we're going to rerun the code to be able to get to this point. Um, but it's I just I really want to make sure that once we redo that. Uh, that, that everyone is able to get to this point because we're going to need to continue from, from here. So if you have your uh, partial code pull up, well, we, ha we have to rerun not everything because I, I don't know if you recall, but there are some chunks here that take some time to run. So if we just come here and do like run all above, that's going to be a little bit messy. So instead of doing that, I just want to uh, point out to you the, the, the actual chunks that we have to run to get things going. So I want you, so if you're looking at your table of contents here, right, if you're not seeing it, you can toggle on and off that button right there. And if you're not seeing that button, just try to, to like increase the width of the R Studio window and that will appear. So see your table of contents and come here on the all V. So I came to the all V um, chunk and I just want to go right below it. And on this summary chunk here, I want to say run everything, all chunks above. So you can just run that. And you see that progress bar going and things appearing here. And you just to make sure if you want to like um, increase here your console, if you're not seeing any errors here, then it means that it ran all right and you have everything you needed. I'm just going to minimize my console so it gets out of the way. So that was part of what we needed to run uh, before getting things going. Let's see, the next one we have to run is, so all between the summary that we're seeing now and all the way through until mod K, mod KM2, all of that above was just us deciding how many zones we wanted to have. We're not gonna go through that now. We have ran all that and decided that between two and three zones was enough for this field and we decided to go with two. So we need to have that model here in our environment to continue. I wanna ask you to run this mod KM2 chunk. Oh, sorry, we actually, I think I'm actually missing. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm missing one step here. So before running the mod KM2, we actually need to run the all VN chunk, which is under data prep for K means. So all VN, we can run that. Should be pretty simple and then you go to mod km2 and run that and now we should run okay the so which uh, which chunk are you talking about Yeah, my line numbers may be different. So this one? Okay. Is it was it? I mean, if, if anyone else is having issues, please let me know. Uh, I'll, I'll be glad to. I mean, I want all of us to be on the same page to be able to go through today's class. So please let me know if you're having any issues. Oh, joining. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And then just make sure that after you type, you do run the chunks because um, to have the variables and then it will go through. Could you please scroll up to your all VN chunk real quick? Mm -hmm. Just let me make sure. So Sarah is, is copying this one. Okay. All good? Yeah. Okay. yeah, no worries. Take your time. Yeah. So all VN.
And this is something that um, what we're doing here, we're basically only running the chunks that are actually needed um, to continue with the analysis, you know. So, and and just just so you 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 also realize how many more chunks we have, where we're really either just exploring data or cleaning data, or you know doing something that is not well. I guess cleaning is important, so cleaning is included here. But just like plotting data, for example, is something that we should always do, and it's really important. But if you're just trying to get the data ready to continue, you don't really have to plot it every time, right? That's what I'm I'm trying to say. So really only running the minimum needed chunks to get us going. Okay, so after all VN, we went to the mod KM2. So if you have not run that, please go ahead and do. No, like, right, can't find ECA underscore V. Okay, so this is where so I just went to that ECA underscore V. This is where, so it was like all the way up on data import on the table contents. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely help you all later if that's okay. Yeah. All right, okay, so, I mean, I don't, Without these, I don't know if you're going to be able to follow though. Is that okay? I'll, I'll help. I'll help you out later with that. Okay. All right. So, anyone else having issues, at least up until mod KM2? Right. I don't hear anything. So, I'm going to take that as we're all good. So, after mod KM2 here, uh, we can really just come down to the to the to the next chunk. And I think we had this, we had developed this already, which is basically just saving that zone or cluster membership to the, to the same data frame that has all the other information. So please go ahead and just run that make sure you have the zone DF object created. And then we made a map. Um, I did not have that chunk written, so could you just oh, like go back sorry. to it real quick? Yeah, sorry. I yeah, and I maybe we didn't we didn't do it. I'm not sure. It's been a while, so. Yeah, so on this cluster here, just while we, um, Victoria is going through it, what we're doing is we're taking that all VN, which was a data frame that came in to create the clusters on, on K means, and we're creating a new column there that we're just saving the, the, the cluster assignment from the cluster model, so mod K and two objects, and then turning that into a factor because otherwise R sees that as numeric as one, two, we want that to be a factor. And then we're just binding that with the columns of um, that. So because all VN is just a numerical, if you recall, because K means only requires numeric or, or can only handle numerical variables, meaning that all VN did not have the geometry. So then we're, we're first bringing that all only numerical data set, um, creating a column for the cluster assignment, and then joining that with all V, which has the geometry. So we're just bringing the geometry back and transforming that into an SF object. That's what we're doing in this chunk here. Victoria, could you please let me know when you're when you're ready? Yes, I got it. Okay, awesome, thanks. All right, so let's uh, go to the next chunk here. I think this was the act, actually the last chunk that we ran last time. And if you do not have it, I'm good, just gonna leave it up on the screen for a moment for you to see and, and, and copy the code. 
We're going to further develop a little bit more of this code once everyone, once we're all on the same page. <clears throat> so I think, do, um, does everyone have this this code here? Or... Are you... Oh, nice, awesome, awesome. Okay, perfect. So we have every, everyone together. Um, so what, while if you're catching up, I just want to make the point here of something that I was originally going to ignore, I guess, for sake of time. But then it was a really good thing that Dr. Birk brought that into his part of the, of the class. And I just wanted to show you how I would have done that in coding. So if you remember from Dr. Birk's class, we, we all had this conversation about what to do with those like speckled effect of like some small pieces of cluster being found inside other clusters. And Dr. Rick showed you how to work that. So basically how to merge and not have this speckled effect um, on um, Ag Leader SMS. And I wanna show you here how I would do using code. But before we actually do that, I just wanna add a couple more um, lines of code to this, to this plot that we have right here. So one of them is going to be, let me see. Yeah, so if you just right after the scale fill colorblind, you add a plus, hit tab. I wanna add a title to this, to this map here. So if you guys recall, if I wanna change the title, there is a function called labs for labels. And inside of this function, it has a whole bunch of arguments and one of them is title. So I wanna say title equals, and then you open and close quotation marks every cursor blinking in between them. And I wanna call this unsmoothed zones, like that. So if we just run this, you know, it basically just does exactly what we did, adds a title on the top with the words that we chose there. And then I also wanna change the theme of the map um, here, so I add a plus, hit hit return, and I want to use the theme that's called theme underscore map. And the reason is may, mainly because in something that I believe was Sarah that asked once, like the, the X axis here is really cramped, like we really cannot see what's going on there. And one really, I mean, if you really want to show the coordinates, then we'll, we'll, we would have taken a different approach, but I, for our purposes, I just want to remove the, the, the labels of the Y and X axis. So theme map does that automatically for us. So if we just run theme map, then it, this is what it comes out. And theme map does not come, um, I mean, if, if, if you are not being able to use theme map, like if you run and it says theme map not available, it's because this function here comes from the package uh, DG themes. So if it's not available, you can just do a quick library GG themes. You should already have this package installed because we use this, we've used it in the past. Uh, but this is how you would make sure the theme app is, avail is available for you. Another thing I want to do here is I want to do and I want to add a plus and hit uh, return again. And now I want to change the color of this of this um, of the title here. I want to ch change that to blue. So when we just want to apply a blanket theme that's being preset we can just use any of the ones that come from theme underscore and then there's a whole bunch of options if any 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 time you're feeling creative and you want to explore them i would really tell you i would really encourage you to do that there are some very different ones here so we're using the theme map but if you want to change something specific about the theme you never do inside the theme underscore something function because there is a function that's called theme by itself. So it's not theme underscore something, it's only theme. And that's the one that we use to change something specific, like something pinpointed in the map, in the, in the plot. So I do a plus theme, and then we have this argument called plot.title. And to, if I just say blue here, which is what we want to do, it's not going to work because we have to use, so we, we know that in, in, DG, in ggplot, um, I guess, philosophy, so things have, have specific types, things are of specific elements and 
a title is of element text. So I have to say element text. For example, if I wanted to change the border of the plots, I would there would be an argument called, I think it's plot boundary perhaps or background. I think it's plot background that because it is like a line, it would be element rect for rectangle. So just so you have some some idea of why we're using element text here because plot because title is a text. So here we come inside of element text, we say color equals blue within quotation marks. And if we just run that, that's exactly what it does. It just changes our plot color, title color to blue. And I'm, I'm making this change very, very strategically and you're gonna see later why, but for now, I guess we can just uh, stay with this. And then I also, also wanna save this plot to file so I can use it later and we will use it later, like the, the plot itself. So to do that, um, without so do not add a plus just come lower in the code and there's a function called gg save i think we used before maybe i just have not really walked us through this that the first argument here we just open and close quotation marks and we're going to tell where we want this to be saved and what name so assuming that you know your your script is inside the code folder we, we need to get outside the code folder and if you recall we do dot dot forward slash do that if we hit tab, we want to, we see the main structure of the project. We want to go inside the output folder. So we just click that. And then I want to call this map zones.png. And zones is the name I'm giving it. It could be any name, but I'm giving it zones. Uh, and PNG is the extension that I want to save this as. This could have been .pdf. It could have been .tiff. It could have been JPEG, JPG. I'm, I'm selecting PNG here, and I also want to well, I want to add a comma, and um, I'm just going to hit return here for to for ease of reading the code. Uh, there it has this GGC function has an argument called width, which is the width of the plot itself. I want to say width equals three, add a comma, and then it has another argument called height. I want to say oops, height equals Four. So when we run that, it's just, I mean, for me, it didn't even tell me anything. So how do I know that it really worked? Well, first, if, if it had not worked, it would, would have probably given you an error of some sort. Uh, so I didn't get any errors, but just to inspect here. So I came again on the file tab, go to the main directory of the project, go to output, and there is where I asked for this to be saved. So there it is, zones.png. And if I open it, this is what I see. Okay. So this is how we exported the... So notice here that we're not exporting the data set. We are exporting a figure, a plot, right? This is something that, you know, if you were to... If you're doing this for a report or for a presentation or a publication, this is the this is a figure you would embed in that in that document. Okay, everyone was able to follow up until here. All right, let's keep going then. Okay, so um, now there's there's gonna we're gonna do um, some things here that that I was that you don't have on your on your code yet and I don't have on on my partial either I do have on my completed so what I want to ask you to do first well first I just want to show you the problem that we have so just print here again on the console how do we take care of those speckled effects and how do we remove them so when Dr. Brick showed you guys the way that he did was 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 like pointing and clicking, right? He used the mouse and he selected some points and then assigned to another another zone. That is something that I think can be done in R, but I if I have the option of doing something using code instead of clicking and dragging and dropping, I prefer the code option because it is again reproducible and it's scalable, right? In this case, we just have one field, but what if you have a hundred fields? You're going to be pointing and clicking. 100 times, that's going to take time. 
So my goal here is to show you how you how I would do that in an automated way. So I have on my zone completed code that you don't have yet. Um, I just want to show you what we're going to do next, and I will provide you the completed code afterwards. So don't worry about it. So we're going to use a focal window, which it has multiple names. Some people call it like a kernel window, an average moving average window. Those are all pretty much the same. Has anyone here ever heard of this, this concept? Were you saying focal window or local window? Focal. Focal. Okay. I've not heard that term before, but I have heard of a moving window average, those terms. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So those are pretty much, you know, different or different ways people, people refer to this. But what we're going to do is basically we're going to create a window. That's why it has that, that name in there. And you can think of it, the window of being this, this black uh, rectangle here or square here that is like three by three cells. Okay. And you can think of our zone map being the underlying pixels here. So what a window does, it basically it sets in the it starts in a place and it just moves like one row and one. Um, I mean, it goes in, into one direction first and then it comes back, but it moves like one row or column at a time. And every time it moves, it looks it, so that the, the pixel in the center is the one of interest. And then it looks at all the, the surrounding pixels within the moving window and it does something that we're asking it to do. So in this case here, this moving window is extract is setting the value of that central pixel as the minimum value of any neighbor on its surrounding. So if you see here, the original value of this pixel is eight in this, and this is not our data, it's just an example. So this is the value there is eight, and it looks at all of its neighbors within the moving window, and it is applying a function of minimum. So it finds a zero in, in one of the neighbors, and it sets the value of this pixel in the middle as the minimum of its neighbors. So that's why eight becomes zero then. And I imagine that this, this focal window is just continues to move and is applying that for every pixel. So every pixel that we have in this, in this figure is gonna be the center pixel at some point. And it's gonna have its value change based on its neighbors that are defined by the size of the window and by the function, which in this case here is doing a minimum function. It could have been an average function, in which case it would take the average of all of the neighbors and assign that average as the value of the pixel in the middle. So this is what we're going to apply here in our case, in our data set. I don't know if that was, if that was clear, if anyone has any questions about how this works at this point. Of course, you can define the size of your window, right? Right. You it's can, not just a standard size. Yes, that, 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 that's a great observation, George, because yeah, the two things that we change here is the size of the window. So if you want to do like a two by two, three by three, five by five, I mean, it really has no limit. And also the function that's being applied to, to the window itself. So the size of the window and the function that is being applied in this case, here is the minimum function uh, are the things that we can change. So we're basically going to apply this filter on our zone data set in a way that is going to look at all of the neighbors. And let's say if this middle one here is zone one, but everything around it is zone two, we want this to become zone two as well. So that's what we're going to do with this filter here. Okay, so um, we're going to do some more coding here that you don't like, we don't really we don't really have yet. So if you, so the next thing that you have here is how are clusters affected by the variables used to create them? This is gonna happen afterwards. So I just wanna give a lot of returns here just to get out of my, my site so I don't get this confused. And I want, we're basically going to develop a little bit more of this table of contents here. So the next thing I wanna do is, uh, is what I'm calling uh, so we can use the hashtag just to add a, a heading level one on your table contents. And I'm going to call this like smoothing, um, smoothing zones. And then you can just hit enter. If you notice that added this, this line in your table contents, that's how the, 
the hashtag outside of the chunk does. And the first thing that we're going to do here, you can create, we're going to be creating some new chunks. So creating new chunks is something that we have not done a lot in class. Um, I just want to show you here the, you would come here on this C plus button and choose R that would add a chunk to your code. There is a shortcut, uh, but I only know the one for Mac. So I don't, I don't want to get some of you with a shortcut and some don't have a shortcut. So I just want to show you the manual way of doing by doing that. And I want to add a title to this chunk because if I add a title, it appears on my table of contents as well. So I want to call this chunk here grid R underscore R. And the reason is, I don't know if you if you recall, but we did use a grid that was a raster before when we were doing interpolation. And we're going to have to do a little bit of interpolation here. That's going to be a lot simpler than before, but we're still going to need that. So let's let's create that grid. So we're calling this object grid underscore R. Use the assign assignment symbol. And if you remember, we to create the grid, we use the boundary first. And when we did when we ran all above when we came here to eda and ran all above the boundary was one of the things that we read into our environment so we should have it there so we start with the boundary underscore w use a pipe uh, we hit return and then to make a grid there is a function called st underscore make underscore grid and it has an argument called cell size that i want it to be 10 and that is 10 meters because the boundary is in UTM, so we, it has a meter um, unit. After that, we add a pipe, hit tab, and we transform this to uh, an SF object because when we say make grid, make grid makes a raster. I want this as a uh, vector file. So STSSF, we add a pipe. Now we use a function that's called st underscore rasterize. Oh, that was not available for me. Maybe we didn't load it. So the st rasterize comes from package stars. So if, if it was not auto completing for you when you start, started typing it, it's because we have not loaded the package. Let's just go ahead and load the library stars. That's the package it comes from. And we have used the package stars before, so we should have installed. We just need to load it. So st rasterize, okay, now it appears for me. So it was def definitely that, that fix it. And then it has two arguments that I wanna change. One is dx for dimensions in x. I wanna say then dx equals 10 and dy equals 10. So we again, ensure that the grid cell size is 10 by 10. Yeah, no matter 10, Greek soft game and people are terrorized and trying to go to get, go get killed if they go to a soft game. And then finally, we just add a pipe there. And I want to, so we, um, so I'm not gonna be making the plot to not spend time on this, but I just wanna crop this to the boundary itself. To do that, we use a function at st underscore crop, and we just say boundary w inside of here. So it crops within that extent. I'm not gonna be making plots and showing you how this works because we have already done this for the grid R, and I this is not the point here. So I just, like if we created it, we can print it just to make sure it is it is there. Okay, it is a stars file. Um, I mean, it is it is all there. So that's all we needed to know really at this point. So let's, okay, so we created the grid um, and now we're actually going to do the focal, the moving average uh, focal window right now. So you can go ahead and add another chunk there and make sure to click R. So your chunk starts with R. This is interesting and just, just to quickly tell you, the reason why there are so, all these different options here is because R markdown files actually allow you to work in any of these languages. It's not just R. So if for some reason I wanted to use some Python code, I can just create a Python chunk. Oops, let me just delete this too. So I can just create a Python chunk that instead of saying R, it says Python. And this is how R Markdown knows what language I'm using. And that's the reason why all of our previous chunks have an R right there. And it has to have that R in all chunks, if you, if you notice that. Okay, so 
the next thing here is we're gonna we're gonna load a couple of packages well let's just first let's just give a title to this chunk here i want to i want to call this um smoothing as raster just so it appears in our table contents and we know what we're doing and we're going to use a couple of packages here that i actually don't recall if we have installed i'm just going to tell you what they are so the first one i'm going to use the functional library and is the package stars extra like that with the e uppercase if you don't have this package just remember you can install it very quickly and easily just by doing the install.packages and then here you have to use the quotation marks and say stars extra like that don't forget that the e is uppercase that makes a difference so if you try to load this package and it tells you package doesn't exist just go ahead and install it and then try to load it again and then it should work and besides this the stars extra package we're also using so library we're also going to use the package g stacked which is the one that we use for interpolation Okay, so I want to create a, uh, an object that I want to call zone underscore s, meaning zone smoothed. Right, we use the assignment uh, value, and then we start with our data set zone underscore df, which has already been created. Is the one that has the cluster assignment and all the variables as well. So I'm just going to print here zone df so we can see what it is. It has like eight columns here including the cluster variable, which is, again, cluster and zone I'm using inter interchangeably here because cluster is the lingo we use from the function itself. We're doing a clustering analysis, but we're using this within a zone, in a management zone approach. So cluster and zone are interchangeable in this case. So the first thing I wanna do, we can add a pipe. The first thing I wanna do is to select only this cluster column. If you recall, when we want to select only a column, we use a select function. And with that function in specific, we always explicitly say what package is coming from, which is the dplyr. So dplyr colon colon select, and I want to do, do cluster to only get that column right there. So I'm going to run this, and I, something I want to tell you is you can just copy the zone S and paste, like you can give a, a few returns here and just paste somewhere. Because then every time that you run something, you can just run the next piece of code to see what, what happened to print that object and see what's going on. That's, that's a, good, a good tip. Okay, so after selecting this, uh, the thing is for us, so right now zone DF or zone S actually, it, it has a geometry of polygon. And for us to apply the moving average, uh, we have to have this, as a point. And I'm not gonna get into the details of this, but we just that's just something we have to do. So to change this from a polygon to a point um, layer, we use a function called st underscore cast. And then inside of it, we tell what is the type that we want to change into, which is point. So we have to open and close quotation marks and uppercase say point. That is just the default that they have. So if we just run this, it gives us a warning that's totally fine and if we print now we see that we have a point type of vector not a polygon anymore okay the next thing here is just that i want this geometry to appear as x and y instead of geometry and this is and this next step here is is purely a we're doing this purely because the focal function needs the data set to be in a certain way before you can apply the focal function this is what we're doing here is just to get this in the right shape so you know it's something that so just so you know so to do that then we we add a pipe hit return and we use this function called st underscore sfc to xy meaning that it's changing from an sf um coordinate to an xy coordinate for us. So if we just run that and print it, it's basically just changing here. So instead of now showing just a geometry, we have this x and y um, lines right there. 
Okay, we're getting closer to the actually doing the focal one. So the next thing is I want to transform this, which right now, remember, is it, it is a point file, meaning that it is um, vector. We need this to be as raster to do focal. So to do that, we do st underscore s underscore stars, remembering that stars is the package that deals with raster that we're, we've been using. And if we run that and we print it, we see now that it is a stars object. And now finally, let's finally get to do the focal function here. So add a pipe and the focal function is called focal two. So focal number two coming from the stars extra package that we just loaded above. So there is a focal two R and the focal two only. We want the focal two, so without the R. And it has, as we were saying, and let me ask you this, who remembers, we just mentioned this a few, a couple of times today, who remembers what are the two things that we need to give for a focal function to work? There are two things that we have to specify. And I'm just gonna show you in my completed version, the example one, so you can, maybe you get some hints from it. The, the it's, it's window we're using. Mm -hmm. The size. Yeah, and um, what else do we need to tell this window? That what operation is gonna happen in this window? Yes, the operation, the function, right? So again, this this window here is a three by three because there are three cells in each direction and is applying a function of minimum because it's extracting the minimum value of all the neighbors and assigning that value to the pixel in the middle. So that's exactly it, thanks enough. So focal two has those two arguments there. So to specify the size of the window, we use this argument called W. So we say W equals, and then we give it a matrix size. To, there are a few different ways of specifying a matrix size in R. I wanna show you the one that we just use a function called matrix and we say one, and I wanna use a matrix that is five by five. So I say one, five, five, like that. If I just print this function here, the matrix one, five, five, so we can see what that does, that just creates a matrix that it has five columns and five rows, and there is a cell in the middle. And this is something very important for focal operations like this, is that if I specify, so the, the size here, the five by five has to be an odd number. If it is an even number, let's just try four by four so you can see what happens. If it is an even number, what happens is, so it does create a matrix four by four for you, but notice that you don't have a center cell. You don't have a middle cell right there. And that's the issue. So always when we're doing focal operations, it has to be odd numbers. So it could be three by three, five by five, any odd number really. I want to use five by five here. Okay, so we specify the size of the matrix of the window that we wanna have. I wanna add another comma there. And now we have to tell what operation to do. The, the argument here that does that is called fun for function. You say fun equals, I wanna extract the mean. Okay, so what we're going to do in our case is come here for each um, each center pixel is going to be the mean of all of its five by five window neighbors. This value here could have been minimum, maximum, and sum. I think those are the arguments that are that the focal two function takes on the fun argument. Okay, if we just run that and print it. Is still a, a stars object. So it, it's not, just by printing, it doesn't really give much uh, good information. So we're gonna be plotting this in a moment here. So we see what's really going on. Um, and because it is a raster and I prefer to plot as vector, I just wanna add a pipe and do st underscore s underscore sf to bring it back to vector. So notice how we started with vector and then we, we went to raster to do the focal function and then came back to vector. That's kind of what, what I'm doing with all this. 
So I so I just run that. That's that's basically where I stopped right there. And we're still gonna have to do a little bit more work here to get this uh, into a, the shape that I want it to be. But before we actually do that, uh, let's just create a plot here. So come, come below, let's create a new chunk so we can really inspect and understand what's going on. Let's create a, an R chunk right below it. And I wanna call, call this smooth plot like that. That's the title I wanna give it. So we're gonna start with the zone S uh, underscore S um, object at a pipe. And then we're gonna start a ggplot. And now within ggplot, remember, we do not use pipes, we use plus. So it's gonna be ggplot plus, hit return. And we're gonna use a geom underscore SF. And let's just, let's just do that for now and see what happens. Just run that. Okay, so it it ran. Let's see here. It, it, let's let's just change the color based on the cluster ID, just so we see. To do that, if we recall, come back to the GMSF function. We use the AES function. I want to say fill equals cluster because cluster is a column in that data set. And outside of the AES function, I add a comma and I say color equals NA. So let's just print that. Okay, this is this is what we have. So if you, I mean, we're not. It still doesn't. It doesn't look the way that it will look in the end. But what happens here is, if you remember, let me just come back here and show you something. On zone DF, I want to do something quickly that you don't have to do, but I just want to check the unique values of the zone df column cluster. So we use this function unique here to assess that. So it only has two unique values, one and two. What about if I do the same for zone s? So instead of zone df, zone s. Ha, huh, look at that. Look at how many unique values we have for cluster now. What happened is our zone df had cluster as a factor, one and two as factor, meaning that they could have been called A and B and it would still be the same meaning. But when we did the focal function, it saw those numbers, one and two, treated them as an actual numerical variable. And then when it was taking the mean, this mean now, imagine that you have like one, 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 two, 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 one. This mean now is a numerical value that ranges from one to two, which is what we're seeing here that the values of zone, zone S have, and what we're seeing on the map as well. So we don't see now that we have two distinct colors. We have now a gradient because the areas that were like speckled now are an average of the surrounding neighbors, meaning that they're not one or two, they're somewhere in between, which is not what we want. We want one or two. So let's come back here to the, to the chunk above and I just, yeah, I think I was actually going a lot slow, slower today than I thought it would. Uh, so maybe we're gonna have to, yeah. I, mean, I think we'll probably be done still hopefully by Wednesday, but if not, we just use Friday, next Friday to finish this as well. I mean, to finish everything through the profitability map. But I just wanna do one next step here to close the train of thought before we wrap up for today. So what I wanna do now is look into our zone S values and how, so if we have values that range from one to two, how do, you how do you guys think that we can create a rule to assign those values either to zone one or to zone two? How can we do that logically? Like not in, not in code, but just thinking about it. We can uh, round them up. Round? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good option. I, I actually did not think of that, but that's a really great, uh, great, great idea. Anyone else has any 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 other other thoughts? So here's what I thought, and actually thinking in retrospect, I think it's, I think that your 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 idea is very clever, Snap. It's not what I did here, but let's just go ahead and do what I had in mind, and then um, I'll, I'll show you what I thought for doing all this. So I want to use a mutate now because I want to create a new column. 
and I want to call this column cluster underscore s. So notice that we do have a cluster column, but we don't have a cluster underscore s. What I what I want to do is create um, a condition. To create a condition, there's a couple of different ways. We can use case when if it is a very complicated condition, but if it is a simpler binary condition, if else works just fine. So let's use if else. So I want to say if else cluster is less than 1.5. And then we add a comma and the next thing is then. So if cluster is less than 1.5, then cluster underscore S is gonna be one. However, if this condition is false, meaning cluster is more than 1.5, then cluster S becomes two. Okay, so if we do that, and now if we check the unique values of zone S, huh, still looks like we have some, oh, that's because of cluster underscore S, yeah. Now it's only one and two again. That's what we wanted. So now if we just come down to our plot and we, and we plot, instead of plotting cluster, we plot cluster underscore S, which is the one that we just did the if else, Ha, huh, look at that. Look at what happened. Right, so I just, uh, we're gonna finish up here. We're not gonna code anymore for today, but I just wanna go back or maybe I will um, bring this out here and come here so we can see. I mean, of course the colors are different and we are still gonna make the this smooth map look nicer. Uh, my zoom is on the way. Okay. But look at what happened. So because we applied that function that was of, a, it was taking five by five matrix that those many, so 25 pixels at a time, looking at the pixel in the middle, looking at all of its 24 neighbors, taking the average of the neighbors and assigning that average to the middle pixel, we were basically able to smooth out all the speckling that we were seeing before and then really make our clusters very concise. So Leo, did, did it affect, I really can't tell from, from this, but did it affect the, the boundary between the two zones at all with the average? Yes. yes, and that's, that's George, you just made a great point that I was gonna leave for next class, but since you asked, I'm gonna go ahead and show it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, let's just leave it for next class. I think, you know, some of our students may have to run to another class, so. Great. Let's just leave it for next class, but the, yeah, we'll, we'll just, we'll do that. Just yeah, the answer that. is yes, it did. Yeah. And then we're going to, we're going to uh, work that out on the next step. Uh, okay. This process. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. Well, this is what I had for today. Again, I thought we were going to get a little bit farther away, but I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to be all wrapped up with the profitability exercise by next, um, next Friday. And I had an assignment that I was going to give it to you today, so, but we have to finish this first. So that will probably come Monday. At the end of the class on Monday, I will have an assignment for you related to this moving exercise. Okay, I think that's all I had. Anyone has any questions, issues? I was going to ask about how this class offer is not the same at all in the class, but you seem like it's totally different. So Sarah, and then, and I'm going to repeat that so everyone knows, uh, Sarah is asking about the arc map exercise because so she's doing the exercise here in the lab and she's saying that what she's seeing is very different from what Dr. Morari had and was walking through. So I think maybe, are you having some issues just to follow because of that difference? I can't even like, the program is really different. I don't even know how to open the file. But okay, yeah. Different interface. Yeah, was anyone else having issues with that? that could maybe give some advice. What was the question? We couldn't hear what, what is her, the issue exactly? So Sarah is uh, trying to go through the exercise um, that Dr. Morari showed using ARC map. And she's not like, she, she, she's saying that the software is completely different of what she has here and from what he was using. And she's not like being able to find even how to import data. Like I think 
so he he was using he was using the art pro that might be the thing i mean you could do it on art map but he was using art pro so if you use art map it is going to look a little different it has the same capabilities for what he was showing as far as i know but that's probably why it looks different were you able to open art pro in the in we here don't have art pro on computer. we don't Okay, so maybe we don't have our pro in these computers. No, those computers do not have our pro. They have an earlier version, and uh, it's probably whatever Emily has. So, uh, yeah. but I mean, it'll still work as far as I know. Yeah, you, you just have to make sure you have the geostatistics um, package pulled up. You can just Google the function that he's doing, and you, and you can just find so many uh, people. So about. those of you guys who have uh, ArcMap and have um, successfully worked on this, um, maybe you can just get together with Emily real quick. Um, so I'll stop the recording. And, uh, you know, Emily, if you want to join the Zoom um, from your computer, and perhaps uh, Sunab and uh, Emily who have, and Yanis who have already worked on this or others who have worked on this can kind of lead you through the steps. Yeah, so, I, I have not made, uh, disclaimer, I've not made much progress. I just know that there, I know that I opened it up and I was able to, yeah, I don't really have anything to show, but I know that they both can, can work interchangeably. Uh, Sunab and Yanis were you, or any others, were you guys actually making progress on this? Yeah, we can help them, this is good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Sarah, 